Okay, well, we did say goodbye to Africa, and uh, then we arrived home on Wednesday, August 5th. And the reason there's a change in a voice is because I'm going to tell you the part of the story that Bill has no recollection of. And I guess that's a blessing. So, I arrived home on Wednesday, and by Thursday evening, Bill mentioned that he could not urinate and was very uncomfortable. So in the middle of the night, we drove to Covenant Emergency, where he was catheterized, what a relief, and within six hours sent home with a Foley and a recommendation to follow up with a urologist. One urologist, a former doctor of Tiny's, was willing to bill, see Bill right away on Friday morning, fixed him up with medicine, thought everything was going to be great. But on Saturday, the same issues were there, no relief, went back to that same urologist, more medicine, Sunday, no relief, and then Bill began to vomit and weaken. So back to the hospital on Sunday, where he stayed until Thursday. During his stay at Covenant, the doctors treated Bill for fever, diarrhea, C. diff, and hepatitis A, but no relief. Many blood samples were sent to the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta because of our trip to Tanzania. As the test results return, all of them negative. Bill became silent and unable to move a muscle. In the middle of the night, on Friday, August 14th, Bill was transferred to U of M Hospital by helicopter after an M, uh, MRI showed lesions on his brain, brain stem, and spinal cord. Because of this discovery, Bill was put on a ventilator as a precaution, so they said. My first encounter with U of M Hospital was with a very knowledgeable and kind nurse in ICU who asked me if Bill had a living will and what were his wishes for life support? That was a pretty shocking question. My second encounter with the staff at U of M was a team of doctors that closed the door to the waiting room and suggested I call in the family as Bill could stop breathing at any time due to the lesions. Thank God for creating families and we do have a big one. Down the distant road as things improved Amy said to me, Mom, I think I better talk to Mike about having more kids because if something like this happened to either one of us, we need more kids to help us because it took all five of us, myself and our four daughters, to keep watch over Bill 24-7 and support each other. U of M took good care of Bill throughout that weekend with three teams of doctors studying him. There were infectious disease doctors, Neuro neurological doctors and neurosurgeons, but they could not agree as to what medical protocol would help Bill improve. Meanwhile, Bill became weaker and weaker. I have many heroes during this ordeal that Bill was going through, but one of my heroes was Dr. Rajaji, who returned to work on Monday. He was the one in charge of the ICU unit in which Bill was housed he reviewed Bill's chart and gathered the three teams of doctors together for consensus. He suggested that Bill had ADEM, ADEM, which is disseminated encephalomitis. If you take a look at this picture of a brain, you'll see the white matter where the arrows are pointing to. Those are the lesions. I was ecstatic that a diagnosis had been given. It actually, it was an answer to much prayer. ADEM is an intense attack of inflammation in the brain and spinal cord that damages myelin. Myelin is the protective covering of nerve fibers. In other words, Bill's body short-circuited, which robbed him of all his bodily functions. Dr. Rashashi was curious about Bill because ADEM is more likely to occur in children and I quickly informed Dr. Rajashi that Bill was indeed young at heart. He also said that the treatment was a risk, to which I said Bill is a risk taker, and he would agree with the treatment. The treatment, large doses of steroids for seven days, and then a period of steroid weaning. At this point, Bill could not move a muscle. We think he could see, but when they lifted his eyelid and you know, took that light and moved it left or right and up and down. He could not move his eyes up or down or left or right. 
He kept his eyes closed most of the time, and later, when he was starting to recover, he mentioned that he had had double vision quite a bit. Bill could not talk, but he could hear, and miraculously we could interpret his needs. How? I do not know and remember. The oral incubation through his mouth was re replaced with a tracheotomy, and a peg tube was surgically inserted in his abdomen for feeding. Other complications were blood clots, diabetes, and the inability to do anything on his own. Bill made great progress in the following two weeks, thanks to Dr. Rashashi's assertiveness. He pushed Bill. He pushed him to get off the uh, uh, ventilator to breathe on his own. He turned off the ventilator and walked away for four hours. Those were the longest four hours of my life because this was very, very difficult for Bill. The result? No more ventilator. Dr. Rashashi removed Bill's trach when everyone else said it was too soon. And he was also influential in sending Bill to the acute rehabilitation floor before those rehab doctors wanted him. Thank God for Dr. Rashashi. But Dr. Rashashi was not the only reason for Bill's miraculous recovery. Prayers by many were heard in heaven, and Bill's life was spared. As I come back, I want to thank all of you for the prayers that you had for me. I'm most grateful that I'm able to make this presentation today, because, uh, and I firmly believe it's because of the prayers of people like you and, and many others in the community. I had a conversation with our local priest here in town, Father Bob, that I was expressing my appreciation for the prayers that came out of Blessed Trinity, and he says that he thinks that there was a funnel of prayers going straight up from the community to the Lord, and I firmly believe that that's why I'm here. So as I started waking up in Ann Arbor and seeing all of our daughters, and especially Paula from Chicago, and then Pastor Brand, I said, what is going on? Wh where am I? Where have I been? What day is it? What month is it? And I know that because of Karen and, and the girls, they were wonderful patient advocates that I'd been well taken care of, but I really didn't know where I was or, or what had happened. But it was a big day as I uh, started becoming conscious uh, that I moved out of the ICU unit to the neurological general floor. Uh, Sister Roxy and, and my mother Dorothy were able to come visit me and I was very happy for seeing family although I always kept telling them they should go home they've got their own families to run and, and uh, take care of and, and be with. So as I moved out of the neurological f floor and into the acute rehab floor one of my greatest joys in this whole process was when I had my first shower after about a month. You're lucky, no photo but there was uh, an occupational therapist named Bob that gave me that first shower, and I'm still eternally grateful for him. I had to relearn to have a lot of control over all of my body parts. Rolling over, walking, swallowing, shaving, brushing teeth, bowels, and it didn't all happen at once. But much of it improved gradually over the three weeks I was at the U of M's rehab. 